Welcome to the Local Engineer Podcast. I'm your host, Drew. Follow along as I seek out engineers from all around and dive deep into their stories. Let's do this. Today on the Local Engineer Podcast, I have with me Professor Santana Roberts from Kennesaw State University. He is the Formula SAE faculty advisor and a licensed professional engineer. So that's going to be a topic I want to hit today is how did you get your PE, why did you get your PE, and whether or and what your opinion is on students getting or going for their PE. It's kind of a contested topic, whether or not it's – is it worth it, is it not worth it? Um, is it worth trying to find a company to be able to train under a PE or if there's a back door that you were talking to me about earlier <laughs> that hasn't really been explained too well, um, as well, what we were talking earlier before we started recording your reason behind not picking a job for the money and why you should pick there, why other reasons. And it's not going to be the same uh, mulched over motivational story that you always oh, hear, no. like like never quit, take what you can get, you know, go the distance. And all these just it, we've all heard that, we've all heard it. And but when the when it comes down to the moment, what do you do? Why do you do it? And then why? What was the determining factor on it? And then how would you get into it? So we'll start with your education. Um, where'd you go to school? Um, and then anything with the school that you'd like to mention of, um, if you had any particular moments in time that kind of led you to be an engineer, um, or to go towards your PE, because that's another thing that a lot of our listeners like to hear is what is something that kind of points you in the direction of being an engineer? Because there are some people like, like me who all through high school or even post high school that, oh, well, I'm not that good at math. I can't be an engineer or specifically what happened to me. I had a teacher in my high school told me that I would never be an engineer because I couldn't get out of, or I couldn't understand a, a basic algebra concept on a test. And that infuriated what? me. Yeah. They were like, Oh, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? I'm like, I want to be an engineer. And he goes, yeah, find another dream is what he said. Really? He's like, yeah. He's like, cause you can't do this. And I, that, that infuriated me. And well, that could be a driving point. And that was That's a driving really point driving for point. me. Yeah. Uh, but I loved being in the, I like working with my hands, but I didn't necessarily want to be a mechanic. Um, I just, I, I liked, I saw the difference between a hobby and a job. And I like working on cars as a hobby. Um, I didn't want to do it every single day. So also, cars for was for you as well. Yeah, well, that explains the whole essay. <laughs> yes. So that and and uh, one of the driving factors for me with picking uh, KSU was in fact the Formula SAE racing team. And I saw I went. My dad took me to one of the invitational races when I was still in high school, and that gave me. I didn't even know that existed. And then I saw Georgia Tech's car uh, or their SAE car there. And I was like, oh, man, this is a this is a big competition. This is like there's it's not just a little local group of people with a go kart. It's a full blown system. So um, that was my driving factor of why I wanted to be. And I mean, and I'm still growing up. I identify as a child. I'm I am not an adult. I'll be an adult when I have a kid. Um, up until I have a kid, I, I'm not an Ooh. adult, so I, I'm still growing up. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I want to do. Um, so that's but... <laughs> that's actually an interesting point of view. So um, it is funny that um, you know some cultures it's an age, or you have to go on some kind of venture, and then you're an adult, you're a man, or you're an adult. You know, and that's interesting. When in actuality, I don't think it really is an age, or you know, going out on a venture. I think it's that sense of responsibility. So. Uh, just hear me out with this one. So what I'm saying is um, I believe the 14-year-old kid who is raising his 8-year-old sister because his father is an alcoholic drunk is more of a man than his father actually is, and his father is the one who has kids. Agreed. So that's that sense of responsibility, and that's something engineers need to have is that sense of responsibility because a lot of people, you know, they make a mistake. They feel pressured by the management you know, managed to get on everyone's nerves. That's what my little adage I like to put for managers, <laughs> which is bad because I was in a management position. But uh, <laughs> hey, uh, but anyhow, um, so um, when you sweep things under the rugs, what are you not doing at that point? What happens when you, why do you sweep things under the rugs? 
to forget about it, right? Right. All right. So if you're forgetting about something, then you're not learning from it. And when you're not learning, then you then you tend to make the mistake again. And so when the repetition of mistakes is where you can have problems in the industry. And um, and good engineers learn from their mistakes, so they need to have the responsibility to just take it in. All right, this is what happened. And feel that uncomfortableness. You know, actually own it and feel uncomfortable because that's going to jog in your memory the next time something happened. Oh, I was uncomfortable because of this, and, you know, I was humiliated, so therefore let me not do it again. Whereas if you swept it on the rug, you might just forget about it and accidentally right. step on that rug again and <laughs> pop it out. So um, especially if you wear size, you know, 15 and a half, 16 like I do. You, you yeah, make so we'll, uh, we'll take a tangent on that because uh, <laughs> on this episode, unfortunately, we will not be running the cameras. Um, that That's would... a good thing. You don't want to see my ugly mug. <laughs> but um, – your height and weight um, was a yeah. We can leave my weight out of that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I still want your skateboard, but I'm too big. Right. So I remember you came up and you're like, "Hey, how, you were what 280?" Yeah, I'm, yeah. I was I was actually close pushing close to 300 with the whole COVID, but I'm back down to 275. Now. But you are what height? Six nine, six ten. Well, I was I was six nine, but since I got married, you lose a little bit of the spine. I'd say about six eight. <laughs> so yes, six, dear, love you, honey. Six foot eight, almost three hundred pound, just mammoth comes up. Can I get on your skateboard? Uh, it's your rated for. It was cool. It's rated for two hundred pounds. Or, oh, no, sorry, it was two, 250. It was a 200-pound rider with a with upwards of 50 pounds in gear. No, but you can get on slim fast. So I was like, if I air it out and bottom it out, I think we should – or if I air up, we can bottom it out and be okay. So um, – which I still need to do. So for – so just for those people who are only going to be able to listen to this first episode – and this will be – this will not be the last episode we have with you. We're going to have many more episodes to come in the future, um, especially when it comes to topics on, um, on being a PE or being a different projects. And then uh, being able to talk about certain projects that you had dealt with in the past at previous companies, um, there's going to be some topics that we're going to get into, uh, not today, but on the next episode, we'll get yeah. into, we'll get into certain things. Um, so, all right. So let's start with let's, let's go. Let's start with school. What made you kind of want to be an engineer? Okay. Well, that's that's actually started with my father. So, um, dad was a single dad raising twins. I am a twin. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, my twins just now engaged. So he's got a six pack and still six foot nine. But um, I got a mini keg. It's more fun at a party. <laughs> But anyhow, um, it started there because dad, to make extra money, he was a local PD. And um, to make extra money, he'd work on a car. And so, you know, similar to you, and I loved helping him. I was always out there helping him because I had smaller hands than his bare grizzly hands. <laughs> um, and so he'd be like, reach in there and, you know, get that nut for me. And I'd be like, all right. Or if he dropped something, that's when I came in handy. Um, and I'd go, dad, I really like this. I want to do this. And he goes, well, grease monkeys don't pay enough, so go to school to be an engineer. And so a lot of um, problem with today college is, you know, people go into college and just because the pressure, people tell them to go. Yeah. And um, if you look at the most successful people, like I'm talking upper tier superior successful people, you know, a lot of them, yeah, they go to college, but they drop out. Elon Musk. Yeah. Um, so. Bill Gates as well, right? Didn't yep. he drop out? Yeah. So if you're looking at those people, they found something they're passionate towards and they just went with it. So um, a lot of mistake is people just going to college because they feel that pressure. And so... For me, it was my father stepping in and saying, hey, let's do this. And I was a 4.0 student in high school. And in fact, being as tall as I was and athletic, I played basketball. And my first offers were like Cornell University. In fact, my twin was so pissed because my, my twin got it. He, he went to college. He's got a biology and science. But um, the first call we got, we were sophomores. And we, my father was talking with somebody for about 20, 30 minutes. And he got off the phone and was like, well, if that's somebody interested in you guys for basketball. And Greg goes, all right, Dad, who wants me? And he goes, ha, ha, no, it's Cornell University. They want your brother because he actually has a 4.0. Oh. <laughs> but I, I didn't go there because, you know, I come from backwoods of Tennessee. And so, therefore, we'll save that other joke for another time. <laughs> but um, <laughs> there's a joke that goes with that. But anyhow, backwoods in Tennessee, we have fun. But anyhow um, – being from there, not my most of my family didn't go to college. So if you're um if you're in a predicament where you feel like college isn't right for you just because your family background, don't be afraid of that. Um, but also know that college should be a resource for you to get to where you want to go. It's not just 
go to, you know, talk, get a bunch of student loans. That's not the ambition, right? right? Um, just because people tell you to, all right? Um, but so that was my driving force. And, you know, I actually went to, I didn't go to Cornell because I didn't know what the heck an SAT was. I literally drove up to the mountains the day of the exam with no classes or anything and took the SAT. And I think I was um, like 20 points off from Cornell's requirement for a full ride. And so I ended up at Mercer instead. Cool. But yeah, it was, it was kind of like you, you know, just working with cars that got me started. <laughs> so then, so you go to Mercer. Um, cool. did, oh, no. <laughs> yeah. So did you start out at, what was your initial major? That's also a, a little a little tad of commonality between a lot of people is they start out as one major and they end up as an engineer. I had a lot of friends who started out in financing and in other sciences that end up switching to engineering because they figure out uh, the passion of it. Yeah. So I actually, I went to Mercy University as a, as a walk on and otherwise I couldn't afford that school. But, um, but, uh, you know, with hope and everything else, I was able to go there, but I already knew I wanted to be a mechanical engineer and because I did my research and, you know, mechanical engineers, like the Latin of foreign languages, you know, it's kind of like the basic, everything kind of broke off of that. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to be ME. So that way I can get a, overall broad feeling and then if I want to I can deal I can dive down either path right and so I, I kind of I was blessed in the aspect that I already knew it you know cool so then you get out of Mercer and then into your first job how did you find or did you intern while you were in college that's another big topic that um and we'll get into that when we get to your teaching position on how you approach or, uh, yeah, how you approach how students should get into internships. I'm a huge proponent of them. Personally, I don't <laughs> – if I had a, a university of my own, you would be required to have at least one or two internships, either just over the summer or co-op semesters, because without it, you're you're going to college for the wrong reason. Yeah, and that's actually important because that's like the apprenticeship a part of the school. Right. And so I think that's very important. I didn't have any. Okay. Um, I had a very unique circumstance. Um, so Mercer, uh, not many people know this, but um, I flunked out. You know, I went from a 4.0 student to flunking out of Mercer. And I did okay in my engineering courses. It was the other courses that I didn't do well in. And part of the reason was, you know, I grew up very conservative, 9 o'clock. You know, dad's father, dad was a cop. And then um, he got married to the daughter of a preacher. And so... 9 a.m. curfew, you know, I was very secluded and closed, didn't go out partying. Well, when I got to Mercer, things went haywire. I, you know, I'm, I, I made mistakes. And that, and so, and that's a, a lot of people make mistakes. And then it's recovering from those mistakes that prevent some people from getting where they need to be. All right. And so I made mistakes. I failed. I flunked out. Um, um, I came back home. Which, when I turned 18, my father goes, can't miss you till you leave. Boof. <laughs> and so, when I came back home, I had to get my own apartment. You know, I started bartending tables and whatnot. So, you know, I'm down. I'm real down. I'm down low. Um, I was thinking about joining the firefighters because dad's a cop. I like, you know, firefighting would be cool. And my father goes, you know what? You should be a firefighter because there's no way you, you, you can be an engineer now. And I went, huh, Really? You're going to challenge it. So, you, uh, okay. First of all, I don't like people telling me what to do, which you wouldn't believe now because I'm married. Um, but um, anyhow, um, now I love being told what to do. <laughs> but anyhow, um, so we, um, so I, I took that as a challenge and I, I got my grades back up and I went to Southern, I actually went to Southern Poly and got my other grad, undergrad from Southern Poly, which if most of you don't know, Southern Poly was Southern Tech, then Southern Poly, and now it's, you know, been taken over by KSU. I got lucky to got one of the last green degrees. It's not black and yellow. You know, Pittsburgh, black and yellow, black and yellow. But um, <laughs> anyhow, um, it took me, I think, six years, just six or six or seven years just to get my undergrad. And, you know, I was I got on the basketball team was one reason, one way I got in. And I had to coach the basket. I mean, not coach. I mean, I had to tutor the other players because they're like, hey, there's a smart guy. And, um <laughs> Yeah, I was so smart. I flunked out of Mercer, but um, anyhow, um, but anyhow, um, so I helped tutor them, and um, and then they didn't pay for everything. Like they didn't pay for anything when they promised me that they were, and so I had to, um, so I had to wait tables and bartend, which, which you know, 
that's good because you get worth ethnic that's going on there. And actually, that's good on a resume, even though it's not engineering experience. Right. A lot of students have problems with what are, you know, I don't have anything to put on my resume. Your projects in the classroom and even those types of jobs are yep. stuff you could put on there. But anyhow, I, I went through and I graduated and I I was nowhere near the GPA that I had in high school. You know, I I got out of there and I got my degree. You know, the added C's or degrees or something like that. <laughs> but, you know, that happening, a lot of students, I think, go through something similar where they get freedom and then they make mistakes and then some of them just never recover. Well, I met my wife and then my daughter was on the way and a switch went off on me. And um, that switch was like, you know, this is no longer about me because I think when you think about yourself, then it's okay to let yourself down. But when you have to think about something that you really care about, if you really care about yourself, then go invest in a mirror. Uh, <laughs> but you know, um, but um, if you care about something other than yourself and you show that passion towards it, a sense of responsibility to um, be better for that, um, you may find that even within yourself, a little flame gets ignited, a switch goes off. And so I want to be a better representative for my daughter. And then also um, student loans, you know, you have a weekly period or monthly. Well, I can't remember. Six months before you have to start, actually start paying them yeah, off? Yeah, six months. Well, that happened. And with my daughter being born, I had a hospital bill as well. So, you know, what can I do? Oh, I can defer these if I go back to school. But uh, so that I didn't think about that when we were talking originally. But that is something else that popped up. But the main goal was my daughter. I want to be a better representative for her. So I got into Texas Tech and they told me it would take three to four years to get my master's. And I was like, yeah, OK. Um, so while working full time, getting my first job, which I only made 48000 with my first job. That's that's one of the things that, you know, can be um, exaggerated when you go into school is they tell you you're going to make so much money. Right. You know, yeah, OK, that average is that using, you know, California salaries where they have higher living and all expenses as well. So, and then are you only taking the higher average when you tell me this? Exactly. That's what a lot of people forget. They see a range of 50 to 100. Well, you look at that, there's, you look at that 100 and go, well, I know I'm not 100, but I'm more like 90. Yeah. And then everybody thinks that you can, that you're going to graduate, walk out the door with this shiny piece of paper that suddenly your butt's worth ninety thousand dollars and paper's not that shiny it's it's actually not (laughs) and uh then they also don't put the minor on there so come on ksu i'll pay more for you to give me another paper with my minor on it that would be nice that would be nice you Um, get all the work why not right so you mean i can only put this on my resume (laughs) (laughs) that then that's one thing that always kind of was a it was a both a i would say a a common joke amongst the students as well as a common gripe amongst the students of, well, they're filling our brains like a jelly donut that we're going to make bukus of money coming straight out. But my, my current boss said it best and I, I've yet to find another analogy that beats it. I can give you four years to study with simulations and solid works and video analysis and physics on how to ride a unicycle. But I'm gonna. But when I hand it to you for the first time, good luck. You know, you're never. You're not gonna. Yeah, you're, you're not, not gonna get it. Well, first you, of all, you ain't catching me on a unicycle. Like, <laughs> I may look like Yogi the Bear, that circus bear, but I ain't getting on a unicycle. <laughs> My center of gravity is oh. horrid. But it's like it, 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 he's so right because you got to start somewhere, and yep. like like we were talking before, um, every, a lot of these school in, institutions in general, like you, you said it best as well. They started out as introductories to apprenticeships. They would get you prepared to go get an apprenticeship to then start your journey along the path, and which is also where I also see that's the way the, it should be. Yeah, I see the older mentality of find a company and die with that company. You know, you stick with it the oh, whole no, time, no, no, no. and it's because you would you would invest so much time in apprenticing or learning a trade in a very specific hyper focused field. Well, now you can't leave. Now you can't branch out. And what if you're not and, passionate? And if you're not it? passionate about it, you're stuck. Now, um, but now with the school system, you can go pick. On, you'll just look. Oh, I like this. I like this degree. This sounds interesting. And then you do the little, uh, the personality tests to kind of confirm that the way you think is the way you will work. 
Um, and then, but it doesn't tell you how you're passionate. You don't yeah. figure that out either until you get to it. Yeah. And, and the way you were telling me that was, you so far had the best explanation of what, did, what showed you that you were passionate when you didn't know you were passionate about something. So yeah. let's, let's segue into that now. Mm-hmm. So now you're, now you got your master's, um, you're out and you get your first job. Yeah, that took only a year and a half. Oh, to get your master's. Yeah, it took a year and a half and graduated with honors and top of my class, which means the class must have been very small. (laughs) I don't know if it was a height top of class or... (laughs) Oh, my goodness. (laughs) I'm kidding. (laughs) But yeah, I I got my master's and then um, the passion. So we're going to dive into passion. Um, um, The 48 grand was working at a blower and compression company for industrial businesses. So my first job blew. Um, after that, I, I, so one of the things about your resume is a lot of people don't know what to put on it because they don't have internships or co-ops. I hope, hopefully, um, students understand the difference. I mean, I hate to diverge to another topic. No, no, I like going into these things because you don't, a lot of people don't know. The difference between internships and co-ops is the longevity. So internships, you know, you could test the water. It's like dating. And then co-ops are, you know, you're putting a ring on it. Maybe you're not married yet. But uh, because they may not give you a job, and so they leave you at the altar standing. (laughs) But um, anyhow, um, but the co-op is more long term. I see a lot of students taking the co-op and then getting frustrated trying to get out of it because they're not passionate towards it. So if I could, I would recommend the internship. So just you're so young, you know, go dating. Yep. Um, and (laughs) and test the waters. Um, but anyhow, passion. So um, I went from. When I went to my second job was actually they gave me the position because I had a helicopter control theory a project in my portfolio, which was from school. So it wasn't worker experience or anything. It was literally a project from school. And um, they thought it was so cool because they were a simulation display company that mainly did contracts for the military. Um, they mainly they needed an engineer for structural integrity of truss systems, holding big projectors, big domes, and everything else. So really had nothing to do with flow or the helicopter, <laughs> but they just thought it was so cool, and they that they brought me on and gave me a position, and I loved working there. And so um, that kind of that kind of started off, you know, a little bit bigger salary. I was doing something I liked. It was more fun. Um, uh, where do you want me to dive here now? Do you want me to go to the management or do you want me to jump to um, teaching? So, um, so yeah, you were saying before that you had this, you you had gone into the management because um, we were talking about uh, the FSAE team and how the, and, and, and your role, like what is the actual role of the advisor? Because it's, it is supposed to be on paper, you're supposed to step away. You're supposed to be there for validation, not managing the team. But you yourself, also being a professor for the school, you do have that managerial uh, duty to the other students in your classes. So they will obviously bleed over. And that I like the sound of that. Um, And I think other students who are interested in KSU and the engineering program and the Formula SAE team, that there is... There's more to it than what you just see on the outside. Okay. So to tr- transition a little more softly into the teaching, um, you know, we were at where I was a design engineer, and then we mentioned management experience. Um, I went to the other company, got management experience, even though I loved the display because, you know, list pros and cons, and then went with the experience route at outweighed. And, um, for, while I was there, this is um, one of the things you want to key on with the whole um, licensing. Mm-hmm. So I actually started teaching and got into the SAE race team and teaching at a, only a part-time role because the company I worked at had flex hours. So I could come in really early and then I could teach at night. And the reason why I did this is because there weren't any licensed engineers where I worked. And I needed to get licensed engineers to get my PE. Right. So I contacted an old professor and I said, hey, um, I see this part-time position. Do you think? And he's like, heck yeah, apply for it. And so I, so I did. And they gave me a part-time position. And that w- enabled me to work alongside licensed engineers. And so once I proved my, confident, uh, my what, competence, once I proved my competence, you know, I was able to have them sign off as licensed engineers so I could take my licensing exam. And then 
Um, and then I went in teaching based off of passion because the company that I was managing for, after my first year, they gave me a huge raise, my own parking space, and a dang good bonus. And I only had to answer to the VP and the president. And it was, everything was going great. Um, but what happened is my annual review, the VP of the company decided that my flex hours need to correlate with his, which was from like 10 to seven. And then that, um, I couldn't teach anymore because of that. And he goes, I know you love teaching, but, and, and then that, that whole statement right there, I love teaching because I was up on the fence when the school offered me from part-time to a two year limited term. Right. And when he said, I love, I know you love teaching. I was like, holy crap, I do. And so I was making a lot more money at the other place than what they were going to give me just for a two-year limited term. And then my wife was furious. She was like, <laughs> she's like, why are you even considering that two-year term considering you have, you know, guaranteed right here with this company and you have everything so nice? Um, and, you know, but I had a feeling. I had something that I kind of liked, that I liked about it. You know, with the management, you know, you have to deal with, all right, who messed up on the assembly line? What vendors being delayed with this? We have three COs that got to be, the meetings are at this time and this time. Are we prepped for it? Do we have everything together? And there's just so much stress going into it. But when I went to teach, I felt like I was helping society at an exponential level. Because like Tupac said, I may not be the words, my words may not inspire change, but hopefully my words will inspire the person that does the change. Right. And so I felt that was happening while I was teaching. It wasn't happening when I was in the industry. Interesting. So I left a lot of money to go teach and it paid off. Right. More and it, but it, yeah, that's the key point that I want to uh, zero in on is the fact that it paid off not with just the income, but with your overall happiness. And that is one thing that watching a lot of my older friends, um, and I say older, um, they're only a few years ahead of me because that's those are the guys I gravitated towards uh, in school, were all of the juniors and seniors and the super seniors on the well, victory yeah, they lap. They can help you get textbooks. Well, not even that. <laughs> <laughs> they would. Uh, they actually gave me like slight mentorship of, hey, uh, don't wait till the last semester to t- or last year to take all of your upper level engineering classes. Gets like, and that would be something that, oh, that's a very key piece of information that I wouldn't have thought was possible. So you start hanging out with all the older, uh, slightly older guys, and and being with the engineering de- uh, industry, um, I had a lot of friends that were in their uh, mid thirties to early forties. They were coming back out of the trade industry to get their degree, so that way they could go back into the same field and make more money. and make more money because they had spent twenty five years in the application of a certain technology and then, but now they're competent enough and how it works that they need just, to, they just need to know the theory and to have the validation of an ABET degree. So uh, one of my friends did that with uh, IT, but with fiber optics. So he came back, got his ME and then went back out. And I see that with a lot of military people as well. Yes. Like I, there'll be people, you know, older than me in my classroom and you know, they just need, that title of having that that degree before they can jump up to the next pay scale. Right. And so that's what's great about KSU and Southern Poly is just that given that shot, whereas Georgia Tech, it can be very hard and expensive. Right. Well, Kennesaw's getting up there too, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but that, that was one thing that I just liked. I loved the way you said that, that it, the, and as, and it's not, it wasn't corny or cheesy either of follow your passion. Well, you yeah. didn't know. Until you got that exterior validation from it that, oh, hey, wait a second. I didn't think of this this deep. Okay. And someone else recognized you – know, you recognized it from someone else coming up to you and saying, I know you love teaching, and that was your ticket. So that, that was a key piece that I think a lot of people would like to – yeah. And it paid off, you know. So um, a lot of people, especially nowadays, are, you know – it's all about the money, but um, <laughs> they, uh, they follow the money. They're all mighty dollar, and that's what they aim for. And if I would have followed that same condition, then I would have been in trouble with my son. So, right. Because um, my son, you know, his condition with Angelman syndrome, he's um, – he's, that handicap right there is um, – it's very rare, but it's missing a link from the brain to, like, body. Like, he's one years old, and he he's barely lifting his head up. But um, it's been proven that they're mentally capable. They just can't, a lot of them can't speak, and then some of them never walk and so forth. But um, you guys can research Angelman syndrome on your own if you'd like. Let's get back to the engineering part. <laughs> um, so, but if I would have followed that money, 
and was stayed with the industry, their health insurance was crap. So when you graduate, you have to look at all aspects. Look at the, you know, the commute that you're going to be expected, the hours that's going to work. What are their health care packages? Do they have any retirement options? And look at all that before you make your decision. You know, go through the list and weigh all the pros and cons. Right. Well, that health care thing, you know, it didn't carry much of a weight for me at the point because I didn't foresee any issues with my kids, you know, but... I chose the path that felt right to me at the time, and even though it wasn't money-related, I went that way, and it paid off because if it hadn't, then I would be in debt up to my eyeballs with all the hospital. I mean, I they probably have, you know, a hotel car key for me <laughs> where I had to be up there with my sons, you know, doing EEGs and whatnots to try, try to map out his brains because he has seizures and stuff. Oh, wow. So, um, but yeah, so, but the fact that I went with the teaching, you know, only one semester of limited term and they offered me a full-time lecturing position. Wow. And their health insurance, even though it didn't weigh so much at the time, it's almost, it's funny how everything kind of fell into place yeah. when you try to put your foot in the right direction based off of what feels right as opposed to what looks right. Yeah. I, my family has always said everything happens for a reason. Yeah. So, and, and, and like you were saying, it's not being religious by any means. It's just kind of... <laughs> it's just kind of how it happens yeah. to happen. So now you're at KSU um, as a as a professor in the mechanical engineering technology department. Um, Actually, I'm in the ME department. Oh, you're in the ME department. My yep. ba- my apologies. Um, I'm, so so that's, yeah, here's that's where confusing. I got that confusion because yeah. the uh, FSAE team is. Pre- I well, I don't know if I can say this without having the date in front of me. When I was on, it was predominantly MET majors. I'm the first ME, so the advisor. Okay, all right. So then I wasn't. <laughs> my no, you're was... not crazy. No, you're not. <laughs> and actually, we had to. We had the department head have to sign off. So as a lecturing professor, I have ninety percent teaching and then ten percent service. So we had to get um, the department head, um, David Stahlberg, great guy. Um, he had to sign off that that could be my service because he's the MET department head. Gotcha. And so he worked with the ME department head to get that sign off. And the only reason I became faculty advisor is because a student on the SAE race team, who's now the president, asked me if I could do it. Nice. And so I was like, yeah, cool. Yeah, <laughs> then, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. That's, that's what I was looking for a service. <laughs> nice. So, so that's how I got on there. But, you know, the MET department, they – the, the professors are so hands-on and involved with the students that it's, you know, it's, it's, it's almost as if they took their noses out of books to recognize the individual standing in front of them. There you go. And I'm not saying any professors, you know, don't do that. No, I'm but that's just, just in school in general. But just in school in general, you know, you got Richard Kennedy, Professor Emmert. They're all just so passionate when they teach. And so I've... I can see why you would think I'm VVT because I yeah. love hanging out with those guys and, <laughs> you know, learning from them because they have so much more years experience than I do. And, you know, to see how good of a teacher they are, I try to emulate. And so nice. if you're not learning and you're not progressing, then what are you doing? Right. And and that's powerful coming from you as a professor. That And this is one of the jokes of my buddies that are at these uh, Ivy League schools is, well, I'm a professor at this university. I am the elite bow down you know and you know it's it can be it can be hell because if you simply just don't learn the way that they teach then they just fail you because of not because if you're lacking understanding of the material but because of how they wanted you to perceive it and and when it came to the engineering side of it just because the stuff's on textbooks doesn't mean that everyone's going to get it just like the unicycle analogy you know we can read it all day long and you get to the lab and then nothing makes any sense so it's hearing that you are not that you have not stopped learning as a professor that's kind of big and i I, i'd like to point that take that out and point that out that you know you're not a run-of-the-mill and but i i don't plan to have run-of-the-mill professors on here so i i want People. Oh, you got an anomaly. I'm six foot nine, got a twin. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, uh, that is important. And one thing that I've noticed is the more I've learned, the more I come to the understanding of how um, infantile my knowledge is. And so the more I learn, the more it comes to an understanding that there is so much more to learn. And if you think think you know everything then that's tend to be when you fall on your butt right yeah and so so like the assumption what 
AWS yeah. you and me. Yeah. yeah. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, if you're constantly learning and you'll find that the more you learn, the more you realize that you are so, so infantile in the knowledge that's out there, especially with, you know, internet and, and how, and information gets transferred, you know, human society, you're just a speck in this water of ocean. Yep. And so if you're constantly learning, you're just doing yourself and those around you a favor. Nice. Especially even when you're a professor, there are some professors that need to hear that. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not, a, I'm not afraid to, to say that as a student, I loved every one of my professors. Um, every, I never had a problematic professor. Um, but at the same time, there are, <laughs> you know, I, there there are some even that I didn't go to that need to hear that. Hey, just because you're here does not mean you are the elite. It means that you're here, to, like you said, you're here to help other people. Yes, we are paying for this. I'm not expecting, you know, I, I'm not expecting certain things to be of you as a professor. However, um, if you're going to be in the school system itself, it's like you said with being a firefighter. It's not just oh well, it's cool. It's do you have the passion to help and save people with teaching? You need to have the passion of bettering the society. And you said that like within the first 10 minutes of this. So that tells me they know this is definitely not only your passion, but it's a it's a route that you can actually make a difference in. And that's kind of what I would like to do with this show is help people make a better decision getting into STEM because I'm going to be totally biased. STEM is the best in STEM fields are the best industries to be in. Without us, we don't have anything. We don't have stuff. I like stuff. Yeah, uh, <laughs> a lot of people like stuff. Um, so I my credit card can atone to that, right? <laughs> <laughs> so being able to at least showcase and show people what is out there, and that you never stop learning. And just because I got my degree, I'm like you. I, I'm never going to stop learning. I'm only just getting started. You know, I've only I've only been I've only been out for a very short time. And it's just it's like drinking from a fire hose, except you don't have to hand write all your word problems every single time out of a textbook. That's honestly about the only difference, you know. So the fact that you're still keeping that same grind from in industry into teaching and and you're young yourself, so you're not. Yeah, I'm the young in the uh, in the department, <laughs> <laughs> which is why, you know, with the whole COVID situation, with the virtual learning and hybrid, you know. How do we do this on our computer? I don't know. Ask Professor Roberts. Yeah. Um, and then another mistake <laughs> that a lot of, um, well, I wouldn't say it's a mistake. I have one student. He's he said he does it on purpose, but I don't have my doctorate, and uh, and that's very rare in today's colleges. And the reason why is because everybody wants the doctorate, and the only reason I got my position is because I they counted my PE towards my doctorate. Gotcha. And one of the things is my course evaluations. If my course evaluations weren't so good then they probably wouldn't allow my license to count as my doctorate. Now, why were my course evaluations good? Because the hidden gem with teaching is a resource that you learn from that most people don't see, the students themselves. Interesting. So I have learned so much from the students, and just they're, um, since they're so new to something, you know, they'll say something that if you think, if you take the, I'm the expert, I'm the most, I'm the elite <laughs> approach to, then you may not consider what they say. And even though they may not be, they might not even be over 50% accurate with their statement. But even if they're 10, even a little 10% might open up a road that could actually simplify something that was very complex and actually lead to a more cohesive um, teaching style or e learning method or even, you know, solution for something. And so having, you know, if you have 30 students in your classrooms, those are 30 potential doorways that could lead towards something that's more efficient than the door that you are yourself. Right. And so you, as an instructor, our job is, you know, what I feel when I teach in a classroom is my aspiration is whatever matter I'm teaching, I want to get you guys to on par to where I am. So when you leave, you don't have to go through all the experience and tribulations that I went through, and you can therefore become better than me. Right. So my goal is 
you know, I feel all teachers, their goal shouldn't be to make you guys better than themselves. So that way human society can advance. Because like you said, STEM is that advancement feature. You know, it's not Hollywood. It's not yeah. songwriters. <laughs> and COVID, I think, is really shocking the world with, you know, understanding that. Because I think everybody's like, I don't be an actor. I don't be an actor. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but anyhow, um, the STEM is so important just because it leads to society of societal advancement. And if I can advance you guys past me, then you guys are going to do great things for society. That's powerful. That's awesome. So that was a beautiful segue. I don't think I I couldn't have transitioned any better. So now that we've got that background and now you're on the formula SAE and the SA formula SAE is a formula society of automotive engineers. Mm -hmm. Um, SAE themselves is, and I still have my membership actually. I just bought the, uh, last year I bought my professional membership. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, and like, I, I wish I could it. pay the student fee. Yeah. I like the student <laughs> version or the student amount. Um, but the, I was on FSA my, my freshman year of college, I was on the, the combustion team. And then my sophomore year of college, I transitioned over to the formula electric team. So, and in fact, the FSA team, like we were talking earlier was, Quite honestly, the single reason why I picked KSU was because I was at every February, the FSAE team runs their uh, annual invitational competition. So it's a competition that they started themselves. I don't know at what point in time, but they started it just so that they could have a a uh, what's the word looking for a regulated opportunity to test the car and all of its systems two or three months before the big, big competitions up in Lincoln, Nebraska, and uh, I forget where I had in Michigan. Um, I can't remember names either. Um, but, you well, know, with COVID, I've yet to go, so. Right. <laughs> um, so, but seeing that, t- seeing that race car drive around campus as fast and as quick as it was, and then seeing other universities that I had also been considering, like Auburn or Georgia Tech showing up, um, and they show up with their FSAE cars, and you see the competition, you see the team, you see things break, and you see how quickly everyone springs into action to get it fixed and whatnot. And you realize that, hey, these are not mechanics. They're engineers, but they re- they're using their hands. And then you learn even further that not all of them are mechanical guys. Those guys are electrical. Those guys are robotics. Those yep. guys are programmers. Um, the Those guys are marketing and business. Like, it, it's everybody. It's a It's a it's basically a small startup business and it has the growing pains of one every single semester. Um, and it was, it was great. And I think if I hadn't been on FSAE, my, my first year of college, to be completely honest, I don't, I really don't know where I would have gone. Um, I'm not even in the car industry, but being on that team and learning how to work with multitudes of different people and dynamics and certain people that, uh, in certain situations behave differently, how, how to deal with, Oh, you've got 10 guys in a, in a machine shop that are freaking out cause they've got a final tomorrow, but they're in the machine shop the night before finishing parts for the race car. You know, you see, you see things like that and it, it kind of where it, it rubs off on you that, Hey, if they're doing it, then I need to be helping. I don't know what to do. I don't know what I need. I don't know what they need me to do, but I, but I'll help. Um, um, so being, in that, and that was one of my again biggest aspirations is to go just even pick the school. Um, I hadn't even applied to George. I, I applied to KSU first, actually. I didn't even apply to Georgia Tech first. I applied to them first because I saw the race car and I was there. Um, and then Emmert and Connery took me on a personal tour and showed me everything. And I was oh, just you like, knew Connery? Yeah, he retired. He was all, he was awesome. Yeah, he was there when I started, and he retired. Uh, I think couple years ago. a couple years ago so it was yeah. just it was into my last year he he retired um he but he was awesome he was the he was the guy that could answer any question that wasn't textbook related so if you <laughs> needed to go talk to someone like i don't want to use the term like like grand my grandfather the the old the oh all-knowing wisdom of oh i've been in this situation here's what you need to do sonny but he he <laughs> would he would go out of his way to help me think through certain situations. So he, he was awesome. Uh, so if, if you're listening, uh, Connery, thank you. And there's a lot of other students that thank you for what you did. Um, so anyway, sorry, back to FSA. So now you are the faculty advisor of the FSA team. So I gave my little snapshot as to what FSA was for me. 
and how, and that it was powerful enough to me that I picked a darn university solely because of this. I didn't even look into well, what are their qualifications as an engineering school? Is it the best engineering school? I just went, I want to be on this team. These people are awesome. And the faculty was cool. Um, so you being the faculty advisor for this FSAE team, uh, go ahead, go into it, describe it. What is it? Uh, who's allowed in? Um, and what do you recommend people who are interested in it do to get into it? Okay. So, um, the F, the SAE team at Kennesaw State, they, um, they're actually comprised of a lot of students, which I was shocked to find out because I'm, when I'm in the shop, I've become familiar with like 12 of them because <laughs> those are the 12s that really grind and work on the machine. But a lot of people join it and I think they do it because of the notoriety that's involved. Um, like, uh, Elon Musk said, if you want to, if you got to work for, if you want to work for SpaceX or Tesla, then you have to have been a participant of a team yep. entity that, such as SAE. And so a lot of people just join and then, yay, whoop de doo my name's on there. Right. Well, that's becomes a, com- a problem when you go up for an interview and they ask you to tell, talk about your experience. You don't want to tell <laughs> them you were sweeping the floor, right? Um, <laughs> um, and so, um, what, what it is, is it's an entity right now we um, do combustion and we have an electric vehicle that's being made and we're going through growing pains because, you know, we are mainly MET and ME students are involved. We have a couple electrical. We love to get more electrical. And because when you're trying to um, weld battery packs to aluminum, you learn real quick that electrical guy might be able to tell you that, you know, copper and nickel is better. But, um, <laughs> but anyhow, um, and so it's a great group of guys that come in. Um, we got John. Right now, George Williams is the president. Pretty much you just, if you show up and you show interest and you talk to the guys, you know, they're very lenient and lax and they'll, they you tend to get in fairly easy. Um, it's just keeping it. They want to see that you're, you know, you're staying involved. And that's where you really benefit, you know. So um, the, one of the things that is great when you see in the shop is there's there can be times where it's a little bit pressing because people are under stress because, say, right now with COVID, it's not as bad. But when we have competitions, you know, trying to get the car perfect before competition, yep. people will really stress out and sometimes timbers will be lost. And it's because it's young individuals in a pressure situation. Um, but when we see the new people come in and then they you don't. There's there's a dynamic with people that they want to be told what to do and then they'll do it. And then there's other people that will look at a situation and then understand that they can help in a way that's not being told. Like, for instance, you were telling me when you were in SAE, when we were speaking earlier, you would follow a guy and then see what they're doing, occasionally ask a question, and then just be there when they needed something real quick. Those type of people we love because, one, they don't feel the pressure to stop and explain everything to you. Right. Um, the fact that you're following and you're learning, if you ask a question now and then, we can easy, they can easily spout an answer right. out to you. Um, but, if you're, but if you come in with the expectation that someone's going to tell me what to do and I'm just going to do it, you know, those people, they can be helpful, but they're not the engineers that people want in the industry. In the industry, you know, um, management has gotten to the point where, you know, where it's, they can be problematic at the time. And people are waiting for management just to tell them what to do. Right. The, the engineer, especially for small startup companies, which a lot of people shy away from, but I don't see why, because if it's a startup company, that means as the company grows, so does your position. Yep. Um, they want those that are actually look, those that are looking for ways to improve not only themselves but the end, the company that they work for at the same time. Right. So don't sit on your hands. You know, actually look and see, follow that person, see where you can help out. Yep. And so those kind of people that come in really make a big difference. And the group of guys that we have now, you know, they're coming up. Uh, they're upperclassmen, so we're trying to get more younger guys in. Yeah. And just. <laughs> it's a learning process that renews almost every year. Every seems. year, yeah, you yeah. lose your big guys every single year. So yeah, well, they're keeping their big guy. I mean, my fat butt ain't going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I uh, I actually remember a, a few of them distinctively. That um, even after FSA, I still I still keep up with a few of them. Um, I would have one in particular that he was single handedly the best one at SolidWorks, and watching him just go to town was mesmerizing. Um, and because he's doing things that you're not learning in the classes as a freshman, I'm in graphics one and he's over here doing weldments 
that was just mind blowing to me. I didn't even know that was a feature. I didn't know that was a thing. So I would sit here off to the side on the uh, on the computer and just watch him work. I all I would just and I would try not to bother him. But there were so many times where I was like, "What'd you do? What'd you do? What'd you do?" And How'd I you do that? I quickly had to learn, like you were saying, like he's under stress. He's trying to work. He's trying to. Get, if he doesn't finish his part, the car doesn't get done. Nobody goes to competition, you know. Um, so that would be that's one thing that. If I could give a little piece of advice, um, if someone snaps at you, don't get upset because you don't know what pressure they're under. They may have a final tomorrow, but they're still in there working on the race car. Um, so, and if you need to help, uh, the best thing uh, is read the manual, read <laughs> the rule book. You'll hear this a lot, um, and and I don't blame them at all for always premising read the manual read the manual did you read the manual then don't ask that question now then you get to a certain point where okay is it easier to if you see the guy he is reading the manual but he missed something help him out just say hey this is why we're not putting this button on this side of the steering wheel yeah and, you know it's like it could it kind of small things like that but when it's why are you using round tube why are you using this uh this particular tube it's like okay here you can point the, like we were talking Open up the manual, point it to him, say, hey, just read this real quick. I'm going to keep working. If you have questions, lob them at me. But but read this real quick just so you know that this information is here. Um, there's always different ways to go about it. but yeah. and, um, and people are learning their own personable skills. And, uh, and shocker, engineers are introverts for the most part. Yep, that was where I was about to go. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so engineers, um, part of the thing is about engineering is um, you're like a diamond in the rough. You know, you could talk with anybody. Well, I'm a lot of rough. I don't <laughs> know how much diamond that's there, but... <laughs> I don't know. I think you do it pretty well for yourself. So we... Uh, um, I know some of the professors that would consider you a diamond, so let's let's <laughs> proceed with that one. Uh, but the fact that you can actually talk with anybody, that's problematic with a lot of engineers because, you know, they're so analytically and critical thinkers that the political aspect just isn't there. And so an advice that I can give for engineers and how to handle, like, any kind of conflict is less words the better. And yep. everybody's like, holy crap, well, we don't speak anyways. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, what I mean by that is like um, um, if, you have a situ- like, uh, if you have a situation, if you could actually express it without even using words, it's best. Because when you talk about things, you may articulate to a point where it is obvious you are right. But the person that you are having friction against and that you've proven that you're right towards – those words are going to stick to where even after they understand, they're still going to feel some type of way about that situation just because there was friction there. You know, friction causes fires. Right. Um, I watch Naked and Afraid. Yep. You know, <laughs> fire. All right. And, uh, but anyhow, but if you can do it with words, um, if you can do it without words, the better the case. Um, an example is um, Michelangelo. Back in the, yeah, I'm going to take you back. Believe it or not, I was not alive at that point. All right. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> So remember, I'm one of the younger professors. But anyhow, um, but there was um, over in Florence, they had a huge block of marble that uh, one of the sculptors accidentally punched a hole through at a point that was critical to the actual block to where everybody said it can't. Or no, I'm I'm sorry, that's a different story, but that's a good one. Edit that out, please. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyhow, um, uh, Michelangelo was working on a... Actually, no, that is the same story. All right. So. Okay, now I'm not going to edit it out. All right. So, <laughs> wow. Let's, hey, see, professors make mistakes too. Um, but anyhow, um, so, um, but anyway, M- Michelangelo came, looked at it, and decided he could do a statue of David utilizing that one area as open. And so he got the commission and he started working on the statue. Well, the person at the time that was in charge that commissioned him believed himself kind of an expert on in regards to art. And so while he's working on the statue of David, he goes, wow, this is really wonderful, but I think the nose is too big. And so at this point, um, Michelangelo looks and sees that he's standing at a viewing angle that just makes the nose look big because of the way the light is playing off of it and whatnot. And where he could have stepped in and be like, no, you dummy, you're sitting over here and blah, blah, blah. Right. Instead, he goes, okay. And then he, he grabs a piece of marble that was on the ground. And then he goes up to the nose and then he's, he actually chisels in his hand but makes it appear like he's chiseling on the nose. And so Marvel's dusting off the ground. And then he's, 
He goes, and by now he goes, all right, can you stand right there so you can get a better view? And so the the guy stands over to the other view. He goes, how's that look? And he goes, looks great. <laughs> when in actuality, he never did anything, right? He just, um, he proved, he made a point without making an actual word statement. Right. And the guy felt, you know, superior because he was right, even though in reality he wasn't. Right. So oh, can, that's powerful. So if you can if you can express your point without using words, and sometimes maybe without them even knowing, right? You know, it's it's going to play off best because I'm I'm pretty sure Michelangelo he just went home with a good chuckle, <laughs> you know. And so at least one person was laughing and one person felt they were you know adequate. And never, when you get in the industry, never show off, never outshow your boss. Because once you do, you're putting yourself in a bad relationship. Interesting. And so that's never outperform or seem better. If you think your way is right and your manager or boss, you know, has their own opinion, then approach it, approach them as this and, hey, let's do this because it's better. Be like, hey, I was thinking about this, but in your expert opinion, um, would this be able to, to maybe make this more efficient? There you go. So that way they feel like they're in partaking and their experience is what's leading to the solution and it's going to resolve a lot of conflict less words and more action right which as engineers shouldn't be too problem right (laughs) that's awesome no that's 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 super powerful and that's obviously an experience thing um yeah because unfortunately some of those things are times where you don't learn that you've overstepped a boundary like that until you've well passed it um and if you so for me uh, as you probably can tell, I talk a lot. I like to work my way through verbally a lot. And just the other day, we're, we were actually sitting down and working on our communication together because he recognized that I was getting hung up on details that I shouldn't be getting hung up on. Um, That's every engineer. And, I see it in the classroom all the time. <laughs> <laughs> but it was one of those where I didn't. I didn't see myself getting hung up on a detail, but he did. So we literally – it was the first time I'd ever done this before, which was he was in his office. He opened his door to his office. I had my door open on my office, and we were both working on the same model. And he was describing to me in just words because I was, I actually also mentioned to him um, when we were trying to figure out why. He, he simply asked me, he's like, why is this not making sense to you? He was coming at it from the perspective of what can I do to better explain to you? Because clearly something's missing. Oh, Sun Tzu. Yeah, Um, yeah, there you go. It's my Sun Tzu plug. Um, (laughs) um, So he was going Sun Tzu on me. And uh, I told him, I said, it's I genuinely it's it's not you. It's I am a hands on learner. I'm kinesthetic. And then I am uh, visual. And lastly, I'm audible. Funny enough, I'm doing a podcast. But when you give me. only audio i struggle it's just how my my how my brain is so he's like okay takes his chair out of my office and put and goes back into his and that's when we open up the doors and uh he starts just describing to me like michael engine just painting this like picture in only words i'm over here like spinning my wheels in mud trying to figure out what to do because i saw i thought i saw a better way from what he was saying it turned out it wasn't that uh, it was – I just didn't understand what was happening to begin with. So my better way wasn't even on the same flight. It wasn't you know? even on the spectrum. It was – yeah. It was – but it was it was his way to show me – like you were saying, show me without proving me that I'm just wrong, which I, I was. <laughs> there was six ways to Sunday why I was wrong in my approach on it. But he didn't go that route. He took the route of – Let's find it, like you said, just find a different path to the same result and rather than just like rip my work to shreds and tell me why it's not working, tell me why I should be thinking of it this way. He he took it as an opportunity to learn himself on, okay, well, he needs to, I need to learn to better communicate to him because he sucks at listening. So, (laughs) um, so, um, so we just practiced. It was like two or three hours. Sounds like you got a good boss. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, that's I, rare. Mary. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's like, that's rare. You found the, you found the unicorn. It's, it's awesome. Um, the, just being open to stuff like that. And, and, and he'll give me some slack. He'll give me some slack on my leash to, to go out and explore. And then I'm about to step on a landmine. He'll yank me back and be like, Hey, uh, there's the landmine. Okay. I'll go off and do it again, but go this way. So it's, it's, it's really cool. So, um, 
I do highly recommend uh, to anybody else listening, if you can f- find yourself a supervisor or a boss or a company that lets you think freely to a certain extent. If he let me think freely, we'd be off <laughs> we'd be off the rails. But uh yeah, and when you're doing a, the interview process, you know, you can cue in on that during the interview process. Exactly. So look at them, how close do they try to sit next to you during the interview? Cuz if they sit real close to you, well right now it's 6 feet, but yeah, well with the cold covid, yeah. <laughs> but um, if they want if they're trying their best to like, you know, be right on top of you during the interview process and they're just asking, you know, real uptight and a lot of, you know, straight to the point questions, you know, that's probably going to be more of a supervisor that's going to be over creaning over your shoulder and they seem rushed. Mm-hmm. You know, they're probably going to be creaning over your shoulder and be a little bit of a dictator. Um, <laughs> so, um, and so uh, I do that in class because I was accidentally going to make that mistake and then threw in the tater real quick. But um, I'm going to take me, that from you. They call me tater salad. <laughs> but um, anyhow, um, so, but if you see that in the interview process, then they're probably going to be that way. Whereas if they're kind of laid back in their chair a little bit and if they ask maybe some questions that are more like hobby related, then they might be a little bit more laid back as opposed to real critical and anical when you go through that interview process. That's a great piece of advice. That's awesome. Thank you so much for listening to part one with Professor Santana Roberts. That was a fantastic hour. And believe it or not, we have a whole nother hour to go. And with that, we'll see you in the next one.